have been very excited about partnering with the University of the West Indies for the very first international event that the John Hewitt International Summer School will be doing in its time. Today we are having the International Summer School's digital poetry event coming to you live from the University of the West Indies the headquarters of the campus of the university is here in Jamaica, and we are coming to you live from sunny Jamaica. As we consider this year's theme, which says, finding the nation, redefining home and country for a shared future, we're delighted to invite Mervyn Morris and Edward Ball to present their perspectives from their own homeland. But before I introduce our renowned guests, here is a quick video of the UWI regional headquarters who are partnering with the John Hewitt Society to bring you today's event. Our tech team will now roll our video. has taken you right to the place where we are standing today for this very auspicious occasion. Very impressive. My journey to be part of the John Hewitt Society incorporated the input of these esteemed poets who I met at the Uwe Mona campus just across the road from here. Mervyn Morris taught me West Indian literature and introduction to drama. Edward Ball was the person who supervised my Caribbean study. So, it is my distinct pleasure to be able to introduce them to you. Mervyn Morris, born 1937, was Jamaica's Poet Laureate 2014 to 2017. He is the author of seven books of poetry, including I've Been There, Sort Of, 2006, and Peel in Orange, 2017, and three books of criticism, and biography, including Miss Lou, Louise Bennett, and Jamaica Culture, 2014. He's a Musgrave Gold Medalist of the Institute of Jamaica, and I'm very pleased that the Institute of Jamaica has sent a representative here today. And he is Professor Emeritus of the University of the West Indies. Carcanet's blurb in, 20, in 2006 cites him as one of the most distinctive West Indian poets. His work is characterized by economy, wit, and humane seriousness. It is an honor to be introducing Mervyn Morris. Edward Ball is also a professor emeritus of English at the University of the West Indies, Mona. He was visiting professor of, the Carib of Caribbean literature at Howard University, Washington, DC, 2001 to 2002. He was the chairperson for the Association of Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies from 1989 
through to 1992. His three collections of poetry include Black Sand, New and Selected Poems, 2013. There are two compact discs of him reading his poems. Edward Ball, poems from It Was the Singing, New Jersey, Intermedia Foundation, 2002. And Edward Ball, reading from his poems, The Poetry Archive of Great Britain, 2011. He edited Walcott's Selected Poems, Farrar and Strauss and Girl in 2007. His Derek Walcott biography was published by the U UE Press in 2017. The Poetry Archive of the UK wrote of Edward Ball, his poems often offer a tantalizingly pleasing surface only to shift and disclose some deeper world of subtler meanings. Andrew Macmillan of People Tree Press commented on Edward Ball's delivery. Since in a former life, he was a talented actor, and in later life, the public orator at the University of the West Indies, the poet Edward Ball has an accomplished way of reading his poems. As one might expect, he does not disappoint. I am sure that with me, you are looking forward to this event. In our global village, our redefinition of home must recognize the shrinking world in which we live to incorporate people and places which are nearer now than ever before. I'm looking forward to how the poetry, first of all by Mervyn Morris and then Edward Ball, will stimulate us on this year's John Hewitt International Summer School theme, as I'd mentioned before. Thank you, Professor Ball. Morris. John Hewitt International School for inviting Eddie and me to read, um, even at this long distance. <laughs> Most of the poems I'm going to read are from Peeling Orange, no G, P-E-E-L-I-N, orange. Um, but I have just a few that are, were written since then. And this is one of them. <coughs> poems. Sometimes a poem summons you, insisting, write me now or die. Sometimes a poem refuses to declare itself at first, edging shyly into mind, into something new you know you didn't make, something that arrives and calls your name. Peel an orange. I used to say, you peel an orange perfect, and you get new clothes. <laughs> but when my father tried to teach me, slide the knife up to the safeguard thumb, I moved the weapon like a saw in my hand, and the damn rind break. <laughs> and if you have the time, you can come see me in my old clothes, <laughs> peeling. <laughs> Toasting a muse. One man who came to dinner wouldn't eat, just focused on his hostess' instant, eloquent devotion. He'd stand and say, as if proposing a toast, I speak this in your honor, ma'am, you are so beautiful, then chant some passionate verse and sit and drink some more until the spirit moved in him again, then stand and, stand and say, you are so beautiful, etc., and do another item. Funny fellow, 
poet, mad as hell. <laughs> <laughs> I been there, sort of. For in that ambience, I too was smitten by what seemed to me unusual radiance, beauty of spirit lighting up the place. But I kept quiet about it, made small talk, stayed sober, and enjoyed the food. Literary Evening, Jamaica. In a dusty old crumbling building, just fit for rats and much too large for precious poetry circles, the culture fans sat scattered in the first 10 rows, listening for English poetry. Jeff read Larkin beautifully, and Wright too, and Michael Saunders talked between the poems. I don't say they are wonderful, he said, but would not say that anybody says they're great. I offer them as two fair English poets writing nowadays. They're anti-gesture, anti-flatulence. They speak their quiet honesties without pretense. The longer section of the evening's program was poems by the locals, undergraduates, some coarse, some wild, and many violent, all bloody with the ra strains of rape and childbirth, screaming hot curses anti-slavery. Down with the limey bastards, up the blacks, Christ, let's tear the painted paper off all the blasted cracks. The more I heard, the more it seemed a pretty rotten choice to read us larkin. Dull-mannered, scared, regressive Phil, saying no to everything, or soon, not yet. So many bulging poets must have blushed and wondered where the hell they'd ever get with noisy poems, brash, self-conscious, colorful, and feared that maybe they were born too crude. Maybe they were, but it was bloody rude to seem to, seeming to ask for things that don't belong out here where sun shines hot and love is plentiful. For to us standing here, a naked nation bracing ourselves for blows, what use is fearfulness and bland negation? What now if honesty should choose to say in all this world's confusion that we are still too young for disillusion? The Pond. There was this pond in the village, and little boys he heard till he was sick were not allowed too near. Unfathomable pool, they said, that swallowed men and animals just so, and in its depths, old people said, swam galley wasps and nameless horrors. Bright boys kept away. Though drawn so hard by prohibitions, the small boy, fixed in fear, kept off till one wet summer, grass growing lush, Paths muddy, slippery, he found himself there at the fabled edge. The brooding pond was dark. Sudden, escaping cloud, the sun came bright. And shimmering in guilt, he saw his own face peering from the pool. Narcissus. They're lying, lying, all of them. He never loved his shadow. He saw it was another self and tried to wring its neck. Not love, but murder on his mind was he grappled with the other man inside the lucid stream. Only the surface broke. Unblinking eyes came swimming back in view. At last he knew he never would destroy that other self and knowing made him shrink. He shrank into a yellow-bellied flower. Valley Prince for Don Drummond. Don Drummond was a Jamaican jazz trombonist who died in a mental asylum. He killed his 
common law wife and was found guilty but insane and was committed to a mental asylum. Me one, way out in the crowd, I blow the sounds, the pain, but not a soul would come inside my world or tell me how it drew. <coughs> I love a melancholy baby, sweet with fire in her belly, and like a sprite, the woman turned a whore. Cool and smooth around the beach, she wake the note inside me, and I blow me mind. Inside here, me one in the crowd again, and plenty people want me blow it straight. But straight is not the way, my world don't go, so that is lie. Wanna give me back my trombone, man? It's time to blow me mind. I want to read just a very few poems from a sequence of poems which I declare to, be a, to have been written for radio. It, it's called Unholy Week. Um, so very few poems I read. I begin with Peter. Oh, Jesus, you were right. I have denied you, Lord, in spite of protestation, failed the test. When that girl hailed me, Lord, I should have hollered loud, He's God I follow, Lord, and face the crowd. For all my talk, somehow I couldn't then. It's too late now. The deed is done, and twice the crock has crowed. O oh Lord, more than this worthless life I owed to you who made the world make sense. Though hard and overconfidence, you taught that fear is lack of faith, is sin. Yet I denied you, Lord, to save my skin. These bitter tears won't wash away the stain. But oh, my Jesus, let me try again. Make me, as promised, your foundation rock. Forgive me, Lord, and I will feed your flock. Soldiers, hey, boy, if you are God, then say who, say who spit on you. Say who, you bloody fraud. We're going to nail you, Lord. Mm. Simon of Cyrene. Why me? It's just my luck. Another great procession coming through. Some carpenter called Christ. Women weeping, people jeering, and the, and the Roman soldiers hard and cold. Hey, you. Not me. Hey, you. I didn't figure. Take this cross, orders his orders from the Roman guard. I'm strong enough, and this man Christ is weary, bleeding, scourged so deep. Wicked, heavy, heavy load, the cross I bore for Jesus. King of Jews, the sign said. Rubbish. Wonder what he'd done. Malefactor left. So you is God? Then take it down. Teefing don't bad like crucifying. What do you, man? Save all away from dying. Malefactor, right. Don't bother with the master. He must die. But when your kingdom come, remember I. When you sail across the sea, O oh God of Judah, carry I with thee. Grow Nation is dedicated to Cedric Brooks, who was a Rastafarian trombone, not Rastafarian saxophonist. And it's really based on one of the, I won't tell you more about it, but it's based on one of the tunes that he featured in. <coughs> Grow Nation for Cedric Brooks. Out of that pain, that bondage, heavy, heavy sounds, or brother's weary march, or shackled trip. A joyful horn takes off to freedom time, remembered and foretold. Release I, brother, let me go, let my people go home to Ethiopia in the mind.
Case History, Jamaica. In 19-something, X was born in Jubilee Hospital, Howling, Black. In 19, any day plus four, X went out to school. They showed him pretty pictures of his queen. When he was seven in elementary school, he asked what negas were. In secondary school, he knew. He asked in history one day where slaves came from. Oh, Africa, the master said, get on with your work. Up at the university, he didn't find himself. And months before he finally dropped out, would ramble around the campus late at night and daub his blackness on the walls. Poem called Obit. To pay the rent while working on his novel, he got a job in journalism. He jumped into a swirl of bars and drunks and prostitutes, pastors, area leaders, Christians, beggars, politicians, pimps. Baby mothers whispered good material for the novel and now and then a hint of breaking news. He grappled with the fiction page by page shaping the manuscript, honoring our people and the craft. The book was nearly ready when he died. Drive-by shootings, fire bombings, headless corpses, diabolic dons had made him want to do some more on evil pululating in the mix. A voyage. Beware, beware their evil song. They eat your flesh, they bleach your bones. You won't last long. His vessel neared an island, shimmering calm, air still. Enthralling song across the green sea flowing paralyzed his will. Oh, heaven within his reach he felt and swam for sure. His fortune waited, lolling on the beach. Eve. The garden seemed a proper paradise. Auntie, she broke up on a serpent, talking nice. <laughs> Casanova. Flaunting his gym toned pectorals, washboard stomach, fashion conscious locks, he worked, the state, he worked the image of Philandera, every woman's fantasy or threat. But something tremulous inside his gravelly baritone exposed a small boy quivering in the dark, his mother dead, his father gone away. Her story. After the diagnosis, he was faking work, forever scribbling of happy moments years ago, like stoning mangoes, black backyard cricket, teenage, <coughs> teenage love. I'm noticing, I said one day, some girls who caught your eye. But John, why are you never writing about me? He said, I can't remember your name. The day my father died. Mm -hmm. 
The day my father died, I could not cry. My mother cried, not I. His face on the pillow in the dim light wrote mourning to me, black and white. We saw him struggle, stiffen, relax. The face fell empty, dead as wax. I had read of death, but never seen. My father's face, I swear, was not serene. Topple that lie, however appealing. That face was absence of all feeling. <coughs> my mother's tears were my tears. Each sob shook me. The pain of death is living. The dead are free. For me, my father's death was mother's sorrow. That day was her day. Loss was tomorrow. A chant against death. Say family, say friends, say wife, say love, say life, say learning, laughter, sunlight, rain, say cycle, circle, music, memory. Say night and day, say sun and moon, say see you soon. Thanks, Mervyn. Apologies for the sitting, but it's one of the privileges of age. <laughs> Blank sand. If the poem could open itself out and be wide as this beach of black sand, could absorb like black sand the sun's heat and respond to bright sunlight with refractions of tone, nuances that glamour would miss if this could happen. If the poem could yield like black sand, if you looked patiently, polished stones that fit in the palm of a woman's hand could be cool as the sand where the wavelets splash over her feet. If the poem could be open like this breeze, beach to the breeze, like this trees that have known great winds, if the poem could be wide and open, <clears throat> like a love that is larger than desire, larger than fear, if the poem could be patient and wide as this evening, this beach of black sand expecting the night without fear, the moon lifting over the sea, the largo of sunset spreading over the city, as the jagged, wounding edges of our unworthiness are worn down by forgiveness, wave after untiring wave. Pilot boat. They watched at twilight as the ship slipped silently round the headland. The pilot boat snuggled in its lee side, sliding past the boys, the little key in a pool of sunlight. Her cheek to his hand, they mused on pilot birds and pilot fish, and how big ships need little boats to take them safely through the, the through the inshore treacheries of reefs and shoals and tight passages. On the poignancy of need and trust, on pairings and partings, and the animals going into the ark two by two. As the last of daylight dimmed out, they watched the pilot boat turn back to harbor and release the ship to open sea and distance widened between them. They rose. 
he brushed sand from her jeans. They walked away from the beach, across the harbor, the city lights had begun to come on. Soundings, and this is for one of the Caribbean's great poets, our gone, Kamau Brathwaite. The woman sat quietly crying in the row behind me that night at UCLA in 1983, as you read, your fingers tapping the beat, tapping the river source of pain and release. And I'm hearing the beat now as a chapel house woman making rough ends meet, hammers and irons spike into the ground in the open lot outside my bedroom window in the already sun-hot morning of Dover Gardens to tether her one Bajan black belly sheep. <laughs> Your word sounds connect them, sound through them. The one who hears you and weeps a river of love and the one who has never heard of you but pounds her presence into tough earth, connection of spirits across oceans, across deserts, grounds of resistance, resilience, the spirits approve. <coughs> At the Atlantis Hotel, Bathsheba, this is another great Caribbean writer, and this is Lamming. Who's le who left us only recently. At the Atlantis Hotel, Bathsheba, which is in Barbados on the eastern coast of Barbados, where Lamming lived a lot of his time when he was in Barbados. Once Lamming at Bathsheba, looking eastward, and night rising like a great wave widening across the slate gray water. I watched it overtake a late, lone seabird. If you sail due east from here, he said, you will make landfall at Dakar. I felt imagination weigh anchor under me and trusted herself to the sable element. And as we hove clear of the reef, I could still make out his spume of white hair leaping, could hear the echo of his voice returning from the other side of earth, make one with the surf's boom. If you've seen, I mean, if you've seen his hair, <laughs> his spume of white hair leaping, and if you've heard his voice, well, I'll try in my poem. <laughs> For attention. The for attention file that had lain unattended for so long, <laughs> now mostly junk, a few newspaper clippings, maybe still worth keeping, otherwise emails and formal correspondence ready to shred, hotel receipt from a city on the other side of the world I'll never visit again. Sentimental stuff. Then, catchingly different, in black ink and an unsteady hand, a letter that fills the inside of a thank you card. Quote, the, the name at first di di didn't, doesn't ring a bell, so I begin to read. Quote, it's two and a half weeks now since the transplant. Your letter arrived just as I was heading out, out to have it done. I mustn't put off any longer, my reply, waiting for my hand to steady down. It has been be bearable. Meanwhile, I must keep praying that the best comes out of it. I'm not the most positive person but I must try. The date of her letter, 2204-01. Oh 
I wish I could remember when she died. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> Flip side. Preparing every day a face to meet the faces that we meet, we sometimes are quite thrown to find that people recognize us from behind the identities we carefully compose undone in full view of the street. <laughs> the carpenter's complaint. Now you think that is right, sir. Talk the truth. The man was my friend. I build it. I build the house that him live in. But now that him dead, that morgue foot boy, him son, come say him want a nice job for the coffin, so him give it to Mr. Bell Navis to make. That big belly crook who don't know him ass from a chisel, but because him is big shot, because him make big shot coffin, for him coffin must better than mine. Boy, it hurt me, it hurt me for true. Fix where next one, Miss Fergie. That man could have knocked back him waters, you know, sir. I remember the day in this said same bar when him drink old brown and, fr and coxswain into the ground then stand up straight as a plumb line and keel him felt hat on him head and walk home cool, cool, cool. Them was water bird, brother. Funeral, Misa, that boy have to learn that a man have him pride. But bless me days, good enough to make him house that him live in but not good enough to make him for co him coffin. I would have do it for nothing, for nothing. The man was my friend. Damn morgue foot boy. His university turn him fool. I tell you, it burned me. It burned me for true. And of course the morgue foot boy is me. <laughs> <laughs> Guinea hen weed. Clearing a little space, that's what it's really about. Clearing a little space and keeping it. Visitors exclaim, what a lovely place you have here. They see the smooth expanse of lawn, the bougainvillea topiary, the razor straight hedge, the manicured curb stones. They don't see the guinea hen weed, the grin on its face, sleek and leering from the hedge line. Guinea hen weed is a natural subversive. It shuns open ground, deploys the covert strategies of he in hedges and garden beds among the ornamentals round the house. You can't weed guinea hen weed. Most you can do is stub it back with the machete and that, it's, that is knee bending, thigh burning business. My neighbor grows a hedge of guinea hen weed. This, alas, poor privet, I guess you could say that guinea hen weed and I have reached a kind of understanding. <laughs> For now, I have the upper hand. But I don't fool myself. I know that when I leave this place, guinea hen weed will take over for good. <laughs> An aging lady. You'd never think seeing her step so prim and whalebone straight to church, dropping like scented handkerchiefs, now here, now there, a smile. You'd never think so much calamity licked at her heels. Her God had blessed her womb. Six children were her harvest gift, raised them to her image of prissy perfection testaments of virtue for the tongue-wagging town. The blight, when it revealed itself, was cruel. Too long since, are mad, and one of those her only son. Two others, shadowy spinsters, whose pale, proud hands have known no toil or tenderness, flutter on the edge of the abyss. The other two, a tale of bitter marriages. Watch her now, this harvest Sunday morning, sidle splendidly 
and late into her pew, attended by her ghostly retinue of spinster daughters. She turns to ask the number of the hymn, then aiming at the rafters a youthful vibrato, outworships her neighbors and magnifies her Lord. On arch and altar rail, the offerings bloom. Mm -hmm. Small town story. What of the wives they envisioned then, when after cricket and cowboys, they sat in the verandas dark and swapped their chaste pre-adolescent dreams in rivalry of mannish chat, foretelling splendors of domestic bliss. Beautiful those dream wives, rich and down sneaking prejudice, fair hued, if I recall. Too soon, too soon, their tongues discovered, bitch. They leapt too soon to manhood. Too late, they lingered in the stagnant town. The ships came in, the ships went out. They watched romance and vision drown. Then turned from gazing at the sea to win their spurs and battle sores on randy sailor-ridden whores. Woman was sweeter than ever they dreamed and a stickier jam pot for eager flies. Now scre screaming kids with snotty noses, now debts and escalating lies. Reality is rum and puke and endless pointless noons to grieve and a plain fat woman to deceive. <laughs> Telling the time, at 1 a.m., the old woman gets out of bed, puts on her Sunday clothes, and proceeds to walk about the house. Alarmed, we say, Grandma, where you going? Is not day yet? She replies, the man coming to take the house. The house is hers. The mortgage is discharged. But she knows something we have to learn. There's always a man coming to repossess, and he picks his time. Mm -hmm. Out of stock. <laughs> Child is like a spite. I wonder if it happened to you like it happened to me. Take last week. When I go to buy the bathroom tiles, as soon as I check the sample them, I know which one I want, the perfect thing. Not one of the other one would suit. But when I say to the woman, may I have so much and so much of that one? She smile and say, sorry miss, out of stock. Tell me why them put the goods on display if them don't have it to sell. If it was mean power, I tell you I pass a law against that kind of thing. <laughs> As to man, every time I say a good one, one that would suit me just right, when you hear from the shout, answer come back, out of stock. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm downing down now. I, I, a, a way of going. He traveled light. At every stop, he shed impediments. Life is a casting off. Counter clerks, incredulous, peered round queues, convinced some piece of luggage was concealed. When he arrived, eventually, there was nothing to declare. No bags for overworked officials to approve. No guns, no gifts, no drugs, nor precious stones, nor booze. Free of desires and regrets and ideologies, he walked into the night and disappeared. Thanks.
a feast. <laughs> I'm sure you'll join with me in thanking Mervyn Morris and Edward Ball for such a treat today. Thank you very much. Just quickly to say a word of thanks to the John Hewitt International Summer School, partnering with the University of the West Indies Regional Headquarters here in Jamaica for today's amazing event. As we close, I invite you to find out more about the John Hewitt International Summer School through the video that we're about to show. Thanks very much to all who were here today. Thank you. Just taking a moment to tell you about the John Hewitt Society's International Summer School, a week-long festival of literature and the arts in the beautiful Marketplace Theatre and Arts Centre in Ireland's ancient capital of Armagh. It's a gathering of people from around the world who come to meet their heroes and engage with others who share their passion for literature, art and culture who come for readings and author conversations, visual art exhibitions and theatre, for music from classical to traditional to rock, and for talks by leading thinkers on society, community, and the shifting identities in today's changing Ireland. And for writers, there's a rare chance to combine all that stimulation with creativity in a week-long creative writing program that includes poetry, the novel, memoir, screenwriting, and more. In an island loved for its landscape, the North holds some of Ireland's greatest treasures, from Armagh's gentle contours and ancient archaeology, to the North Coast's famous Giant's Causeway, to Belfast set on the edge of a sparkling loch, to the sweeping richness of the green glens of Antrim. And on a small island that produces a disproportionate share of literary greats, there's a surprisingly rich literary heritage in this northern corner. Not just Nobel Prize winning poet Seamus Heaney, but Louis McNeese and Flann O'Brien, Patrick Kavanagh, John Hewitt and Brian Friel, and many who worked and studied in or had parents from the north, including Jonathan Swift, the Bronte sisters, W.B. Yeats, Oscar Wilde and Samuel Beckett. That concentration of literary genius is due, perhaps, to our cultural mix, with our Irish-speaking tradition a link to Scotland's Gaelic-speaking islands and an Ulster Scots inheritance in the Enlightenment ideals that led to so many from Ulster helping to forge American independence. That cultural mix gave us a 1970s poetry renaissance with Seamus Heaney, Michael Longley and Derek Mahan and the father figure, John Hewitt, who combined so many of those culturally diverse strands. Born in Belfast, he made his chosen place the Glens of Antrim, where he could engage with the dramatic landscape and his own Irish heritage. Yet, like so many Irish writers, he would spend years in exile in England. Hewitt identified himself as Ulster and Irish, British and European. And it was from a wider Europe that he brought his distinctive radical thought, his politics and his belief in arts and the community in sharing ideas and ideals. The same belief that underlies the talks, readings and workshops the John Hewitt Society organizes throughout the year. The same diversity that brings people from all over the world to Armagh City and its Marketplace Theatre, to the cultural vitality of the Arts and Literature Festival that is the John Hewitt International Summer School.
our sponsors, whose uh, logos we can see online. In true Jamaican style, we have a little bit of brata, one more poem from Professor Morris, and one more from Professor Baugh. A short poem that's kind of a, an attempt at a definition. I was answering a question, you know, but what is love? Love is a giving and a measured taking, amputation, recreating, everlasting interface, a prison and an open space. A teasing glimpse of holy grail, a generator that can fail, the naked jugular, the knife, the torsion balance in my life. This, the moral of the story, a sweet tooth is no respecter of persons. brings us to the end of today's proceedings. Thank you very much, Professor Mervyn Morris and Professor Edward Baugh, and for everyone in-house here, thank you to the tech team. Those of you who are interested in following John Hewitt Society, you may do so by Twitter, on YouTube, Instagram, and on our website, johnhewittsociety.org. Uh, thanks once again, and we will get a chance to speak to each other now. <laughs>